introducing this series to all of you. Thank you for being here. You're all from design school, I assume, fashion colleges and stuff. Um, thank you for being here at 10.30 in the morning. Um, you're going to have an incredible three days. You're going to get a chance to listen to incredible people, uh, people who are authorities in their field. So I'm really impressed that all of you are here. Um, this is part of Rajasthan Heritage Week. The idea is to introduce you all to some of the legends in the business, the new ideas, their journeys, and I hope that all of you will take away inspiration from this. Um, today you have uh, textile guru Martan Singh, he kicks off the series. Then you have sari designer Pavitra. Following that, I think there's a short break. Then you have fashion anthropologist Philida Ajay. And then, of course, Rajesh Pratap Singh. Uh, you all know the schedule. I'm assuming that's why you're here. Um, we're going to keep it very sort of easy and informal. Half the time, the designers and the speakers will introduce themselves. So take advantage of this informality to ask questions if you want. Let them finish their presentations. Don't interrupt them in between. But chat with them. You'll never get a chance to sit in such an informal setting like this um, and you know get to sort of hear their stories or what drives them. Um, is there anything else you want to know? I'm Nonita Kalra. I'm the editor of a fashion magazine called Harper's Bazaar. I think you've seen our logo outside. I don't know if you've seen the magazine. Um, is there anything that you want to know from me? You can't be this quiet in the morning. This is not natural to any of you. Um, Mayank, who will be introducing uh, Mapu, as he's known, is again very well known for his, uh, he's a graduate of NID and he's very well known for his work in textile. Uh, we roped him in last night because we thought that, you know, it would be nice for him to question Mapu on um, his work and his journey. Um, do you all have anything more to say? Do you want to say anything? What brings you all here? So much silence, and I won't ask the front, be front benches. They're pretending they can't make eye contact. <laughs> what brings you all here? You're all from Pearl, or? OK. And how many of you want to be designers? How many of you walked around and are interested in craft? And are you all originally from Jaipur, or have you? What an incredibly beautiful city. Do you, do you believe that or do you take it for granted? It's so beautiful, right? And the weather is incredible as well. And I have to tell you all, one of the best speakers is Mayank, but he's refused to speak to all of you, so try and bully him. <laughs> Martin Singh. Are all of you students? Yes. Great. And where are you from? Are you from several colleges or from one college? Great. So, I mean, it's so difficult to find a way to introduce you, Mapu, because I really feel Mapu is my life. I'm in textiles for the last 10 years, and I got interested in textiles because of the work of people like Mapu, especially Mapu. Um, <clears throat> but just to share with you, Mapu began his career in fashion, very, very interesting career in fashion, doing fashion shows with the Beatles, running a shop in the 60s in Delhi called Psychedelic at the height of the hippie movement. Uh, moved on to be the director of the Calico Museum of Textiles in Ahmedabad, which if all of you haven't seen, you must go and see because Ahmedabad is just around the corner. It's really one of the finest, finest museums of Indian textiles in the world, if not the finest. Uh, so he had a stint, a very successful stint as the, as the director of the um, Calico Museum of Textiles in Ahmedabad, went on um, over a very intensive 10-year period to curate and lead um, revival efforts initiated by the government of India uh, as part of the Festivals of India, which were huge cultural diplomacy initiatives initiated by the government in the early 80s. Uh, so we're going to actually, he's going to be talking about a lot of the work that he did and facilitated during that period. Uh, and then invo his involvement in the field of culture and heritage with the INTAC, um, which is a very important organization based out of Delhi and now has chapters all across the country working in the area of conservation and heritage. Uh, welcome, Mapu. And thank you for doing this for us. 
<coughs> for those of you who may not know, for the last 10 years, Mapu has largely lived, led a very reclusive life up in the hills in Missouri. So it's, it's great that he's, he's agreed to, uh, to speak publicly and especially to students. Um, Mapu, if I may also just sit down. Um, the Vishwakarma series that we spoke about uh, that the government of India initiated, uh, could you share a little about uh, that? How were they conceived? And what were some of the sort of main intentions there? That, uh, Pandit Nehru, in his uh, discovery of India, uh, wrote a line which I've always remembered. Uh, what he said was that the history of India may well be written with textiles as its leading motive. Because you do understand, of course, that it was textiles that brought traders to our shores. It is what brought us to the rest of the world. We became the master dyers to the world. Now, long before I began in the, in the independence movement, uh, Gandhiji had begun this wonderful uh, experiment with Khadi, the fabric of freedom. And the people who inherited all these different aspects of handlooms and uh, Khadi were Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Pupul Jayaka, Mridula Sarabhai. The, they were extraordinary, extraordinary ladies, rather like yourself. They were enthused for a passion for India. They knew that if they could make a contribution, then it would survive. I had worked uh, by then for a couple of years at the Calico Museum of Textiles, which was created by a lady called Gira Sarabhai. And I do recommend it to all of you to go and see. It is, it is, a, it is a museum which envelops you with the beauty of Indian textiles. They're on the ceiling, on the walls, and on the floor. And when you enter, it becomes like a cocooning of yourself in these absolutely extraordinary textiles. And then that was my school. And it was school to such an extent that I was quite old by then. I was about 25 when I went. When I used to go to Ahmedabad, I used to weep on the train because I didn't really like Ahmedabad. But Calico Museum itself became like um, everything that I desired uh, to learn about, and that was my school. And then in 1981, Pupul Jayaka began a movement for cultural diplomacy with the rest of the world. It was initiated by Mrs. Gandhi, and uh, the first country we did it with was with England. And in 1982, in 1981, she asked me whether I would do a textile exhibition of handlooms in uh, England at the Royal College of Art. It was a tremendous privilege for me to be given that uh, position. But one thing I would like to suggest to you, nothing is done on one's own. It's always with the team of people. And when you think about India and of handlooms, one thing I would like to suggest, that without the person who spins, who prepares the warp, who prepares the dye, who actually spins the yarn, who weaves, who then packages, who prepares the warp. Everything is done by a whole plethora of people. And that is what makes one simple textile that you wear. That's what enthused me most, was this sort of ability for everybody, because I had always believed that actually the India strength was entrepreneurship of individuals. When you see the fruit seller on the road, or uh, Thelawala, uh, you, it's a celebration of entrepreneurship. But in this case, and in many other cases of craft, you see the coming together of people who work together in this extraordinary fashion. Now, Pupul said to me uh, that everything was available. And I began to travel, and I suddenly realized that there was very little left. I went to Banaras, there were no konyas, there was no uh, Padmana, Padmana is where the weft of the sari is slightly twisted so that it doesn't slip from the body. Uh, the, the, none of these skills actually survived. Now you see, this happened by sheer mistake, but it was a wonderful thing. 
there was a painter called Kailashram. And he was in Srikalahasti, and he was sitting on a block, on a, on a part, drawing the Rama and Mahabharata. And from his neck fell out a little gold cross. So I looked at him and I said, are you a Christian? And he said, yes, I am, but don't tell my guru. So I said, but why? So I sent him, to cut a long story, so I sent him a Bible. And he read the Bible in Telugu, and he did three of these kalamkaris, huge. One of which was gift, gifted by the Prime Minister of India to the Pope. And that one was called um, Mary Mata Swargalog Ekuta. Because, according to Kailashram, the only person who went to heaven in the Christian pantheon was the Mother Mary. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, uh, this, is, uh, that, that, this is the crucifixion of Christ. But just look at the beginning. If you look at the beginning, was, uh, there's a small square of, uh, of Ganesh. And then, if I'm not mistaken, there's the star of Bethlehem that shines on everybody. Next, please. Uh, you see, this is, this is glorious. Uh, there were very, very few paintings at that time uh, of um, uh, Trees of Life where indigo, real indigo, was used as paint. Uh, it was used as the dye stuff. You could do it as a background, but not as paint, uh, to uh, delineate a space. So this was a bamboo uh, thing uh, created in Vijayawada by a group of painters, and they painted this. It, it was a great success, by the way. Um, you see, this is a very beautiful thing as far as I'm concerned, because um, the red of that ground is a madder ground. But look at that madder. Nobody to this day can tell me, nor can the painter, how he got that red. And I think it's got to do with the combination of the sun and the water in Hyderabad at that time, where he painted it. And it's a yali. And because of the size of the cloth, the tail moves in a particular direction. Next, please. Now, this is another Kalamkari. Now, I'd like you to look at this one carefully. You see, most Kalamkaris, uh, as with Nantwara painting, which you must be more aware of, have a black outline. This one has none. It is with the red outline. Each figure is only has a red outline. Because when you paint with alum, the alum disappears on the cloth. So while he's painting, the, the form disappears while he's painting. So unless he's a great painter, he cannot paint like this. So we did a two or three pieces, and then he got exhausted uh, over six months. But this is uh, about fish, in, because he was from Andhra. Now. What has always interested me is contemporary traditions. Is, is this contemporary or is this from Mahinjodaro? Uh, I think it's in this use because by this time, of course, the problem was that there was not enough textile art being used in public spaces. So I thought that if we did this exhibition, we could do of... Um, uh, uh, block printing in this case with hand painting, uh, uh, hand brush. Uh, uh, we could then introduce the whole idea of textile arts for public uh, spaces. And I think this is a very successful piece. It was made by a whole group of people. To begin with, the cloth had to be woven specially in a place called Puttapaka in Andhra Pradesh. It had to be flown to Bombay. In Bombay, it was uh, outlined, then it went to Indore, where they filled it in with uh, this black uh, uh, pota uh, ink, a uh, pota is cloth, uh, you know what I'm talking about, uh, and so on and so forth. It is beautiful, isn't it? How, how large it, was this piece? Was uh, 18, uh, uh, most of my, uh, most of the textiles I did, first of all, were 108 pieces in an exhibition. 108 because all malas and all rosaries have 108 beads, and that's not by mistake, because there are nine grahas and 12 houses. Nine into 12 is 108. We can discuss that later. Next. Ah. You see, resist printing was something that I know nothing about still. But this was taken from heads of uh, uh, daggers and the horses. But look at the plethora of color 
And this was done by a man called Khan uh, and his group. I mean, I mean I, when I talk about individuals, when I say self, I mean we. Uh, this a huge palette of colors which was produced, and there's a wonderful designer called Isemiaki, who when he saw it, took it to Japan, and they discovered that there were 800 and something odd colors in that single piece, 18 feet high. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Now, this is an older piece, meaning in the first Vishwakarma. Uh, the inspiration of it was from Mughal textiles. And there are 108 different Mughal textiles done by a famous painter called Amrut Patel. These then became individual uh, flowers, which you may still see in various sarees all over and in India still. You know, people, it became a generic type, the Mughal flower sari. A lot of it was taken, by the way, from the city palace in Jaipur, the borders of the miniature paintings. <laughs> this is the piece from Sanganer. Now, if you look at it, each pattern is different. There were about 1,800 patterns. But what is interesting is that in the third row, uh, the second row from the bottom and the fourth from the left, you'll see resist printing with white. Do you get that right? Now, how do you get that right? That's very, that's very, very complicated, but he did it. And the blocks were about, uh, I think, two inches by two inches, not one inch by one inch, two inch by two inches. And this is now a huge directory of all the Sanganer prints. By this time, I had got uh, a bit older and a little more um, tired. And I decided that we had to leave it to your generation, the one before yours. When you look at Indian textiles, you don't see many birds in the um, plethora of Indian textiles. But these huge curtains, uh, where the fabric was woven again in Andhra Pradesh, uh, 120 inches, uh, that's 10 feet, and uh, very long, and then they block printed it, screen printed it, and hand painted it all at the same time. And uh, the, the purpose of showing the human beings is to show the size of the textile. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, Ikat. Now, the finest designer of Ikat in India for the last 15, 20 years is a young man, not young anymore, but Rakesh Thakur, who's going to show you here tomorrow night. He um, uh, worked, he was actually my right hand in this whole Vishwakarma for 10 years. You see, what he explained to me was two or three things. The first thing he explained to me was when you draw by hand, it's not the same curve as if you take a photograph. If you take a photograph, it becomes still. If you draw by hand, you get the curvilinear line. Now, in Ikat, it's very important to get the curvilinear line. The finest Ikats in the world, especially from India, are from Patan in Gujarat. And what they used to do to make these animals, uh, of which there are very few examples of the 18th century, was to lay a kakha, which is a a pattern on the warp, and then tie it, and then lay the same pattern and tie it in the weft, and then um, produce the textile. Now, one animal on the, on the left was made by Chota Lal Salvi. For, this is printed. One animal was made, it took him 18 months. I had to stop it because I didn't have the money to pay him, but he's done really well since. And this is another tradition of Ikat from Orissa, uh, uh, from Sambalpur. Next. Uh, this, is, um, this is very interesting. I think it will interest you. You see, we have on the 14th of February, St. Valentine's Day. But St. Valentine's Day has, also has an Indian connotation. What it was in Orissa was as follows. If a girl knew a boy, and his name was began with A and her with B, he would write her poem, which made no sense, except if you began with the letter A, and then you'd read around it. Do you get my meaning? So if, and he would write her letter with B, so they'd only, only the two of them would know who the letter was for. So the, this were bandhas, they're called bandhas. And these bandhas we made into sarees, and they were very, very popular because they became a great source of, uh, uh, for engagements for um, the ladies from Orissa. 
Now, this interested me because of the very few pomegranates in Indian textiles, but what interested me most was that you make the pattern with checks. Normally, you see checks as the pattern on the ground, and you do a pattern inside the check, but this is the pattern itself is made from a check. And if you looked at the first motif on the bottom, that's the pomegranate. Now, this, this is something else. This is from Orissa. It's also an ikat. But you know, it is because the alpanas, now alpanas in the homes of uh, 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 where they store food, the reason for the alpana is the prayer is, please come into this home, eat the rice outside it that we have framed for you in this pattern, and don't enter the storeroom. So it's not just a decorative device. It exists all over India. Now in, uh, in uh, Orissa it's called Jyotai, and where they do it with the thumbs, and you get the thumb impression, do you get my meaning? Isn't it rather pretty? And so I said, when you get these thumb impressions, what about doing a firework? And so this lady from Bolangi said, I will do the firework, and she made this uh, sari, which became very popular. It wasn't very expensive, it was only a uh, weft uh, ikat. Uh, this is another experiment that we started with and did really rather well, which was zari ikat, zari in the warp and ikat in the weft. Now zari became so expensive that it had to be false zari, but it, it really rather nice as we did with checks. <coughs> this, of course, is the great noun. Slightly complicated, but if you're textile students, you'll understand. If you make an ikat, you have, in the warp, you have it doubled because um, if you, uh, you turn it over, so when you open the textile, if you have a diagonal stripe, in the center, it'll become a V. You get my meaning? Like so, like so. But if you have it like this, whereas throughout the textile, the black one on the left, then you cannot, so it has to be a double E cut, because it's weft warp and weft, all the way through. Now, the only ones who really understood it were the Japanese. Man, they loved it. It was created by Rakesh Thakur itself. What happened was, there was an American painter called Kim McConnell, and I used to work with him. And Kim McConnell used to do his paintings with cardboard stencils. And I used to look at them. They were really not very beautiful, but they used to make wonderful fans. Now, in Kota, I had seen a dupatta piece uh, uh, Orni, which from Bekaner, which had a human figure. So I said, how did they possibly do this? So I came back to Jaipur, and in the Weaver Service Center here, there was a man from Kanchipuram who had been posted here. I said, can you make me a stencil of an animal, the head of the tiger? And he did. And we printed that stencil on a piece of cloth and then did the leheria over it. And that's the effect you get. Now, you can do a million things with this, if you want, if, if, that is if tie-dye turns you on. Um, but that was then experimented, it worked. Uh, this, is, uh, this is rather, you know, there's a place called Mount Ma Nath Bhanjan, near Bararas, where they, it's now become a power loom, huge power loom place. But at that time, they were in the late 80s, they were struggling to keep handlooms alive. So I began to do these saris with the Paitani um, tree shuttle work in the Anchal only, and they used to sell for 350 rupees. And you'd be surprised to know that the, the, I know the figure for this was 12,000 saris in two years. When you open a fashion magazine, this is called Kinkhab, it's not. This is Gyastir. Gyastir is a tradition of brocades that came to India from China and was used for tankas of Tibet as the frames in brocade. And actually, they were made in Banaras, went to Shillong, and then were exported to China, and then they made the borders and sold them in Tibet. Now, strangely enough, by the time I uh, got involved, Gyasya was finished because the Tibetans had been thrown out of their beautiful land they were in India, they had very little money, but there was a Kala Chakra Puja in Bodh Gaya. 
and I went and paid my respects to the Rinpoche and asked him whether we could send him bales of this of Gassia brocade and um, uh, um, um, Haji Saab, um, um, uh, Haji from Banaras, knew how it was made, and that's how it was done. It's called Gyasir. This is, this is something else. This is, uh, this is a Latifa Buddha. But the most important thing is, of course, which you cannot see in the photograph, is that it drapes beautifully because it has a part bana, this low twist weft, so it doesn't slip off the shoulder. Now, these are Satarangas. The konya, the konya is these patterns in the border. Now, what, what, what just is inside, just for you. Then I think I'll be quiet. I've talked too much. But you see, the one thing that we have in India, which they don't have anywhere else in the world, is the konya chakra, which is the circle in the center with four squares in the borders, which you have in Rajasthan, in most ornies. Do you get my meaning? the circle in the center of the urni with the four con konyas, which are, because unless the konya is perfectly calculated, the circle in the center will never be round. Now that is not an onion. Most other things could be borrowings from Central Asia or Iran or many parts of the world, or Turkey or even Florence. But that is the one distinction and so these konyas are not with the circle in the center because it's a sari. But the dupattas were very, very important and they had the, uh, in the middle. This is the, you see again, by the time I got on the scene, Nilambari Jamdani was finished. There are five traditions of Jamdani, it's too long, but it's complicated in that. Uh, but uh, the Nilambari Jamdani in Dhaka had faded away. The, uh, Bangladesh revolution was in the making. The um, Boshaks had moved into Bengal. They didn't have the wherewithal. And so we began this experiment of whether they could do Nilambaris. Strangely, because of short staple cotton, they had the ability to weave the Jamdanis very, very quickly. Nice. Tight. Thank you very much. Now, each of these saris on the left and the right had to be made, by he was finished, in the Weaver Service Center, and it took two years to weave. Because the finesse of Indian textiles is in its precision. And the precision of those flowers is so, so spectacular that I used to look at it and practically weep. This is a great art. I must explain it to you. You see, you see, it's reverse brocading. The pattern is in white. Oh, look on the left. The pattern is in white. The surround is in gold. You get my meaning? Yeah. Now, isn't that interesting? Where you have the pattern, which is in a sense subsidiary to what surrounds it. And I was in search because the villages were called Karupur in all the books I'd read, and there were three Karupurs in Tamil Nadu, and I couldn't find a single one which had this tradition. And then it was because the name of the village was not Karupur, it was Kodali Karupur. And we went there, and there was one weaver, and then it became a whole lot. But it's, it's an expensive technique. This is a Kanchipur, and there's something else. Anna, uh, Virapan. There was another great lady who did what of work, was Rukmini Devi Arundel, and I salute her, um, Kalakshetra. And she, uh, from Tamil Nadu, and uh, she had a wonderful uh, artist called Virapan, who used to work with her. So I said to Virapan, how many Kanchipuram designs do you know? I said, about 100 or 200. I said, can you weave a cloth with all of them? And he did one with 180 different patterns of Kachipuram on a single cloth. This is something else. We move on. This is a, this is a, a, a thousand buta sari. Um, but that's something else. We move ahead. Now, this is the contemporary traditions, I think, nearly has its best. Sunil Das was a painter and still paints uh, from Calcutta. And he did this in Jamdani, where... Yeah, I, 
I don't know whether you know what Jamdani is. Jamdani is uh, an interlocking where if you travel, say, from the right to the left, the gold, and then you interlock it with white, then you get to the gold of the paw of the horse, then you do that much in gold, and then you go white, and then you go gold, and then you go white, and this is very complicated. But he did it, and there's some sort of some sort of movement in this textile which is wonderful, and there's even an expression in the eyes of the animals. <laughs> Mapu, thank you so much. That's been a great journey uh, through the kind of work you've done and the kind of uh, textiles you've engaged with. Uh, since we are celebrating the handmade in Rajasthan today, is there any message that you'd like to share? Um, about the relevance and the continuing relevance of the handmade today in India and in the world. I'm now your grandfather's generation. So what I say you can uh, put aside actually. However, I do believe that your generation is going to be faced with the need for organic material. I mean really organic material. There's a company in America called Esther Lauder. And Mr. Lauder, the son of Esther Lauder, took me to their factory in Connecticut in America. And he said, you see, the problem with the makeup that we make is we are so used to using synthetics that there's nobody left now who can use the natural material. Could you help us? So I said, the only place that we could go to is Kerala, where they make all these natural high fibers. Now, this is true of textiles as well, and it's also true of Khadi. You see, south of Maheshwar, for instance, there's a company called Europa. They have not tilled the land for seven years, so they don't use fertilizer or pesticide. So the land becomes natural again. And they grow cotton, which is natural. The color of cotton, by the way, is brown. Era Patti, if any of you are from Andhra, it is brown. The white that we wear, that I wear, is actually a genetic improvisation over 2,000 years. But the actual color, color of cotton is brown cotton. It can only grow if there's no pesticide or fertilizer. But it takes color very strangely. The red becomes so intense red the blue becomes so intensely indigo. It is unbelievable. However, that's another matter. But Europa grows this cotton. It is hand spun and hand woven. And I'm not so sure that in the future, we will not evolve machine technologies, machine technologies, which will provide organic material. I think, you see, my interest in Khadi, I suddenly realized my involvement with textiles ended because I decided that I wanted to do a textile exhibition for blind children. Have you ever heard of a textile exhibition for blind children? No. Nowhere. But you see, my bet was that if you hung textiles and you got children who are blind and un to walk through it. They would touch it and feel it and feel it to their skin. And you would get an appreciation of it that you would never get otherwise. And I did it first in London, in the Royal College of Art. 108 textiles hanging, and there were children. Only four of them were stained. So I did this major textile exhibition of Khadi called The Fabric of Our Freedom in Delhi and many other places in India and abroad. And the children came. And this is my last sentence. A child came up to me and said, oh, uncle, you have made me so happy. This feels like the wings of a dragonfly. And I suddenly realized that I had made the most colossal mistake throughout my life. I had not understood that the most important part of a textile is this tactile quality.